it's a pleasure to welcome Ian Selick as our guest speaker today. And his topic is on the early theatre life in Adelaide from 1836 to 1856. I wondered how Ian came to this topic and I had visions of him being a long-term amateur actor or working in local theatre. Um, but he's an electrical contractor who he'll explain how he developed his interest in today's subject. He's going to talk on early theatre life and the conditions of uh, working in the theatre in the uh, first couple of decades of the colony, what it was like for promoters and for actors, the problems they faced and how they coped with those problems, and he's got a whole lot of stories of the early theatre and their promoters. Um, too many to tell you today in half an hour, but um, he's brought along some copies of the book that he's written and um, there'll be a lot more in there, I'm sure. So without any further ado, please welcome Ian Selick. Okay, well, thank you very much for your introduction, David. I appreciate that. And I'm very humbled to be asked to do this speech today because, and it's my first ever talk, so not too much heckling, please. <laughs> okay, I'll start off why I wrote this book. Uh, my unexpected journey into Adelaide's early theatres began when I came across a reference to a theatre that existed on North Terrace in 1839 from a former Buffalo passenger. The fact that a theatre existed in such an early time in Adelaide's development sounded interesting, but even though it considered, I considered it may be only about bricks and mortar I, or little else, I felt it was worth further investigation. Happily as the research progressed I became rather enthusiastic about the subject as I slowly uncovered a very interesting side of Adelaide's early history that I was unaware of. I discovered that a myriad of well-known actors from England were prepared to travel to the other side of the world in an attempt to gain fame and fortune by bringing some much-needed entertainment to the pioneers of South Australia. They found a grateful population that initially flocked to their performances to soak up some much-needed culture and, from, and for an excuse to have a good laugh. The actors enjoyed the encouragement of their very satisfied audiences but in doing so, found that it came with the discomfort of extreme weather conditions and the invasion of their performances by some of the worst types of disruptive characters. <laughs> and so many cases found themselves declaring insolvency as a reward. Well, it's very sad too. Sadly, in many cases, their insolvency resulted in jail time or in some cases, suffering the indignity of having to stow away in barrels aboard ships, departing in vain hope to evading their creditors. Hasn't changed much for some people. <laughs> Van Diemen's Land became their favourite destination after evading their creditors to take advantage of the colony's relief provisions detailed in their Insolvent Debtors Act that gained the infamous name the Whitewashing Act. This slide is an extract of the Sydney Gazette in November 1839 telling the story of a group of theatrical bolters, or Jeremy Diddlers, they called them, that were aboard a ship preparing to flee to Van Diemen's Land. When one of, the, when of, one of Mr Lee's creditors accidentally learned that Mr Lee, Lee's intentions were went, on, were went on board the vessel, and in consequence of the rascals having failed to clear himself at the customs, succeeded in getting him brought on shore. But his woman, and his celebrated dogs went on to Launceston. He had trained Newfoundlands, apparently. Also on board was George Buckingham and Mrs Cameron, whose husband, Sampson, had already fled to Adelaide. In those early days, a night out of theatre may have included the need to traverse flooded streets or muddy streets in the dark, harassment by drunks and prostitutes, or even being robbed. Then, even after entering the apparent safety of the theatre, 
the has harassment by drunks and prostitutes would most likely continue for the patrons. And as one commenter said, if going to the theatre or into a crowd, pick your own pockets before leaving home. <laughs> on most nights, there would be a policeman or two on duty at the theatre to check tickets or to control the troublesome patrons of the pit area who would not only be drunk, but would bring their troublesome dogs with them to join in vocally with the performance. That was interesting, wasn't it? <laughs> Most of the problems stem from the number of late night drinking establishments establish adjacent to the theatres and to the influx of runaway convicts and the many sailors looking for a good time after a long voyage. The slide describes the scene that confronted a patron while attending a performance of the Royal Adelaide Theatre one hot evening in December 1847. His main complaint was the continued interruptions by a group of drunks in the pit and the boxes who persisted in throwing biscuits and nuts at the other patrons. As the colony entered the 1850s, these issues were greatly reduced by the improved function of the law courts and the increase in police numbers. But up until this time, the greater problem of the theatre goer came from the brothels and unlicensed hotels that infested Light Square and the surrounding alleys that harboured much of Adelaide's criminal class. Now, this is a slide of the Theatre Royal in London, which was, which I was very surprised to find because there's very little uh, pictures of uh, interiors of theatres now in existence, so that was good. The layout of Adelaide's early theatres would have been similar to the surviving 1788 Theatre Royal in London, as showing in the slide. Usually the pit area with the bench seating was reserved for the cheap ticket holders who were usually the most disruptive patrons and had its own basic entrance. The patrons of the pit were labelled the pitites and it most likely were the where the negative term is the pits has come from, I think. <laughs> The gallery and boxes with a superior seating were positioned above and around the pit area and were reserved for the more expensive ticket holders and invited guests with their own separate and elegant entrance. Now I'll go on to the, the actual theatres that were in Adelaide. Uh, so this is the principal theatres that existed in that period uh, from up to 1851 I think it was. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, there's probably seven major ones that might have lasted more than six months or 12 months or something like that. And then these are the very minor ones that might have only went for a month or something like that. This is a map of Adelaide and it shows you the locations of all the theatres in Adelaide at that time. Um, so there's, can you read the bottom there? I'm not sure you can read that. So I'll just leave that there for a minute. This map shows the locations of the early theatres in Adelaide. The Theatre Royal or at the Adelaide Tavern was the first theatre to open. The tavern was situated on Town Acre 251, just east of West Terrace on Franklin Street, and was the first substantial stone public building built in Adelaide. The theatre was based on the unique French plan of the Parisian minor theatres that consisted of only a pit nine separate dress boxes and a distinctive entrance and the comfort of a box saloon providing a variety of refreshments. The theatre opened its doors on the 28th of May 1838. So that's only 18 months after we got here. Well, the pioneers got here anyway. Under the management of Charles Bonner, who worked for the Register newspaper as a compositor. Mr Bonner had been a popular singer in Sydney with one of, his, one of its newspapers at the time commenting, commenting that they were surprised that such a young colony could support a theatre and wish Mr Bonner success with his new venture. The second performance was on the 18th and the third was, and last was on the 21st of, 1st of June 1839, 38, under the management of William East, East Thur. It's, it's hard to say that one. Okay, <clears throat> the second one, which was the one on North Terrace, uh, Pan Acre number six. The theatre was opened by Sampson Cameron after he set about converting a warehouse on Town Acre number six on North Terrace that had opened its opening night on the 27th of November 1839. The building was originally built by John Richardson, 
in September 1838 as a warehouse and auction room. It was constructed of pies, lath and plaster, and by all, all reports it was rather drafty and dusty. After Mrs Cameron and George Buckingham arrived in Adelaide from Launceston in February 1840 to join Mr Cameron, the theatre had a successful but short season that ended in July, early in July 1840, when an advert appeared in the newspaper for the scenery and fittings to be sold at auction due to under stress for rent. So it didn't last long. On the 10th of July 1841, the South Australian Register published an article declaring that Mr and Mrs Cameron's attempt to reopen the den of filth and debauchery, <laughs> must have been the opposition theatre, I think, that said that, they call the Royal Victoria Theatre should either, would neither add to their wealth or their respectability. During this short time, Sampson had introduced his patrons to the professional acting of George Buckingham, who had spoken the first lines in the first purpose-built theatre in Australia at Mr Levy's venue in Sydney on the 26th of December 1832. Samson had also employed the famous comedian and artist and theatrical scenery painter Edward Andrew Opie to work in the theatre. Mr Cameron received the title of the father of drama in Adelaide for his work in setting up the first professional theatre in Adelaide. Samson and Cordelia, his wife, had previously established the first theatre in Hobart in 1834 at the Freemasons Tavern and were the driving force behind the building of the new Theatre Royal in Hobart, with Samson being the first lessee in 1837. That still exists, apparently. The Royal Adelaide Theatre, it's probably the most successful one of the small theatres, was erected by Henry Deering in the in the Royal Hotel and Bush Club House in Franklin Street on Town Acre 243 in June 1846. Mr Deering, a former manager of the Queen's Theatre in London, arrived in Adelaide during February 1846 with his wife and three children. The theatre opened on Monday the 26th of June 1846 and after a very successful season of 19 weeks, Mr Deering took his benefit in late October 1846 and closed the theatre for the summer season. Mr Deering then advertised in February 1847 that after the theatre underwent extensive repairs and repainting, the new season would begin on the 22nd of February. On the 27th of February, Mr Deering announced that due to the severe weather and domestic calamity, which was apparently because of the heat, a lot of people were dying in Adelaide, the theatre was reopened on Monday the 1st of March. And it was reported that more than, for more than a week, the temperature sat around 108 degrees Fahrenheit and strong hot winds and excessive dust. There was a report of an increase in deaths and even the newspaper compositors had difficulty in setting their typeface, which is lead. After Mr Deering stepped back from the running of the theatre, Mr James Douglas took over the management and completely renovated and extended the theatre and assured his patrons that the theatre would be kept neat and in a very respectable nature in the future. Mr Douglas, who had previously appeared at the Queen's Theatre in Gillis Arcade, advertised for actors and stipulated that they were not to be con contracted financially to Mr Coppin. I think there was a bit of a argy-bargy going on between the two at the time. During Mr Douglas's management of the theatre, he also insisted on the appropriate dress for the patrons occupying the boxes and that smoking was not allowed in any part of the theatre. Mr Douglas had many successful performances throughout the month of June and many acts well received by the patrons such as the nautical drama The Red Rover, Othello and The Wandering Minstrel. To make life difficult after investing in the renovations, Mr Douglas was in court over a debt to George Coppin for the cost of his passage from to Port Adelaide from Hobart. And then finally, after his baby daughter was found deceased on the 27th of June 1847 in the Bush Clubhouse with an inquest with the verdict of died by a visitation of God. It's very interesting now, isn't it? Mr Douglas found himself with no option but declare himself insolvent. The theatre reopened on the evening of the 29th of November with many of the discontented performers from the Queen's Theatre making up the acting troupe under the management of John Brewer. 
The final performances were on the evening of the 6th, 8th and 9th of May 1848, after which Mr Deering finally closed the theatre with his fa and set fan fire sail with his family to Port Phillip on 16th of July 1848. I've included the circus because they did actually have uh, theatrical type horse things and things like that, you know, but they also did have a few visiting uh, actors that would come and use their stage, so I thought I'd include it. Circus Royal. Robert Redford, who was a well-known horse breeder and jockey of the local steeplechase, steeplechase scene of South Australia, had returned from Launceston in September 1850 after he'd been declared insolvent for losses at his circus in Launceston. There's a common thing, doesn't it? Robert negotiated with Edward Hales Taylor, the then licensee of the Billy Barlow Hotel in Light Square, to build a circus next to the hotel in Coe Street on Tanacre 131 at Mr. Tapley, uh, Mr. Taylor's expense. The circus building was a very strong and commodious wooden building intersected by iron bars was sufficiently strengthened in for the pressure of a full house. The circus, or the circle of performance, was excellently arranged and it measured 42 feet in diameter, performing, uh, creating a building of 126 feet in diameter. The arrangement of the gallery was well designed for the accommodation of a thronged audience and building altogether was, was well adapted to the, be transformed into a permanent and efficient establishment by the addition of a, a few items. The opening of the Theatre Royal was on Tuesday the 5th of November which coincided with Adelaide's race week, which was more than successful with Mr Radford. The clever performances of the theatrical company and Mr Radford were, with his well-trained horses attracted a good number of patrons of both young and old. The band was very efficient and was very pa pantomonic. I should have left that one out, shouldn't I? Representations between the feats of horsemanship created by an enjoyable variation of the entertainment to cater for the various ages. Mr Radford had not only spared no expensive in to render the circus popular, but had also taken great care to exclude the disorderly and bad characters to improve the enjoyment and comfort of its patrons. The performance of the Circus Royal on the 6th of December 1850 was the last one to be organised by uh, Robert Radford. Uh, then uh, the owner of the building, Mr Taylor, took over the management of the circus in January 1851, once again making extensive alterations to the building. They included a splendid stage and complete and elegant redecoration of the interior. interior. And he, he stated that how the, now the first, it was the first amphitheatre built in the colony and at the same time renamed the venue the Royal Amphitheatre. Mr Taylor had a grand opening on the evening of the 27th of January after promenading his new stud through the streets of Adelaide a complimented, accompanied by a lively band. Mr Taylor took his benefit at the circus on the 19th of April 1851 but was eventually imprisoned for his debts in May 1851, stating that the receipts for the Billy Barlow were large but had lost 20 pound a week in running the circus. Does anybody know why the Billy Barlow was called the Billy Barlow Hotel? No? <laughs> it's, it's where the Colonel Light Theatre uh, Hotel is in Light Square. And what happened is in 1850, George Coppin, who was famous for his Billy Barlow impersonations, his brother Frederick come to Adelaide and he took over the hotel. So he named it the Billy Barlow in honour of his brother George. It's an odd name, isn't it? For the third time in only four months, the circus had a change of management and the inevitable name change. When Mr Noble took over the management in March 1851 and renamed the venue Circus Royale, that's right, Olympic Circus, sorry. Uh, and in April, he transferred the Billy Barlow licence to Charles Walsh, the theatre singer, who again arranged for a complete redecoration of the venue by Mr Opie, who also performed there as a circus jester. Then finally, after Mrs Merriton of the Royal Victoria Theatre took her benefit at the circus in the first of, on the 1st of October 1851, the circus permanently closed its doors and that was the end of it. 
It does show up in the um, council assessment books for about three years after that as a building, but then it disappears. I think it was pulled down and the timber was used for something else. The Whitehall Cellar, as you all know, is on, in Port Adelaide. George Coppin and John Laser decided it was a good idea to build this theatre. The foundation stone was laid on the 14th of October 1850 on the corner of Port Road and St Vincent Street, which you can see there. The opening night took place on the 25th of June 1851 after several cancellations due to flooding of Port Adelaide. The extensive complex consisted of the Whitehorse Cellar with a large crescent-shaped bar with adjoining parlour and refreshment room. The cellar area contained a large tap room and a number of smaller rooms and upstairs was the Masonic Hall, billiard room, bedrooms and the kitchen. That's one thing, all of the people in the theatres are always in lodges, you know, like Masonic Lodge or uh, the Odd Fellows or something like that. The separate theatre was 60 feet by 35 feet and 45 feet high, with a stage measuring 20 feet by 30 feet, with a horseshoe shaped pit area and double tiered boxes and gallery. The balcony and veranda were added by Mr Cave in 1856, measuring 140 feet and 10 feet wide. That's why it's in there in 1856. That was, must have been just after he put up the, the veranda. It wasn't there in the original building. On the 19th of June, the port flooded again, with the Whitehall cellar, cellars flooded with some of the barrels of ale and port being spoilt by the water, seawater. Always the comedian, George Coppin made the jovial comment at a meeting of flood victims that it was a shame that the barrels didn't get spoilt by fresh water so that he could make even bigger profits. <laughs> <laughs> On the opening night, measures Mr Coppin and Mr Laser gave an opening speech dressed in the nautical attire and that was well received by the audience. The performances, drama, ballet, farce, the latter slasher and crasher, that was one of George Coppin's famous ones, went off, ex went off exceedingly well. Although on Mr. Douglas, on Mr. Douglas making his appearance, some patrons in the pit created a violent uproar and would not allow the ballet in which he was appearing to proceed. Mr. Laser came forward and addressed the audience in favour of Mr. Douglas, stating that the management has nothing to do with his private life and conduct and or the conduct of their actors but the pittites were obstinate in their opposition and and the piece gone through in a very great confusion and the understanding that the individual would, who were so obnoxious to the audience will not reappear at the port adelaide theater under the patronage of george cop and the newly formed mechanics institute became began using one of his rooms adjacent to the whitehall cellar with the use of Mr. Coppin's vast library. On Friday the 25th of July, while Mr. Morton King was playing Hamlet, many of the gallery pat patrons were making excessive noise and would laugh heartily during the serious parts of the play, thus upsetting Mr. King's delivery. I haven't had any heckling yet. <laughs> give it time. <laughs> I don't know what sort of reply I'll give, that's the only problem. Uh, this was the first time the gallery had been open to the public and on Mr King's second performance on Monday the 4th of August the bent for the, his benefit the management decided to close the gallery to eliminate the noisy gods and to limit the audience to a more respectable class of patron. Sad isn't it? The first month was very successful the new theatre and the patronage from the captains in harbour and their friends enjoyed the drama of the Waterman and the Masonic Lodge men who turned out in their full regalia to enjoy Mr Coppin sing his favourite song, Billy Barlow. Mr Coppin had become famous for his Billy Barlow song act and when he toured Ireland in 1842 before he arrived in Adelaide. Now, Billy Barlow was a man called John Clark and he was a well-known and very deformed character who loved to lurk around the outside of London's theatres in the early 1800s and do tumbling, dancing and somersault type acts. In October, after only four months since the opening of the theatre, the management decided to close the theatre after heavy losses. George Coppin and his brother Frederick left for the Victorian goldfields 
and on George's return in February 1852, he was declared insolvent. The court records detailing his assets gives a very excellent description of the Port Adelaide complex and the Semaphore Hotel. And of interest in the statement is that the, all the real estate that uh, George Coppin had uh, bought, none of it had ever been conveyed into his name, so it was still with the creditors. The theatre continued to operate under various managers who were able to attract many well-known acts to the theatre up until 1866 when Mr Natman purchased the property and converted the theatre into a brewery. Mr and Mrs George Loder were most likely the last act to perform at the uh, theatre on the 4th of July 1866. Queen's Theatre, you've all been waiting for this haven't you? I've got no information on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> Mr Solomon purchased the whole of Town Acre 176 less the northern 40 feet that constituted Osmond, Osmond Street for £378 and, in the memor and this memorial was lodged on, in the Grove in, in July 1840. So it's interesting that there's two uh, names mentioned there, Barnum and Vetris. Barnum was a famous singer in England and Vetris was a famous actress. And I'm not sure, Elizabeth might have been his wife, but I'm not sure. Mr Solomon then published a prospectus to, a prospectus to, to finance the project in August 1840, offering 400 shares at $20 a share, pound a share. The shares were to be used to build the theatre and five houses facing Weymouth Street. The cost of the project eventually cost £10,000, but on other accounts they mentioned thirteen or to £14,000. Emmanuel Solomon invited John Laser of the Royal Victoria Theatre in Sydney to manage the theatre that was and had its first performance on the evening of 11th of January 1841. Within weeks of the start of the theatre of the second season, it had become apparent to Mr Solomon that the theatre was financially unstable again. Thus, the financial difficulties were inevitable. Mr Solomon dismissed the whole company and closed the theatre on the 21st of August 1841 and immediately arranged to have the bench seating in the pit removed with the intention of allowing public use of the theatre for meetings, lectures and dinners. They don't last long, do they? John Laser negotiated a, negotiated a lease with Mr Solomon and ran the theatre the under the, its lease until the government um, took it over as law courts in July 1843. At, at this time, Mr Solomon purchased the remaining 40 feet of Town Acre 176 and the same of Town Acre 177, which is next to it, with the obligation that he would maintain the northern 20 feet as Osmond Street. Also at this time, Osmond Gillis decided to upgrade Gillis Arcade for better access to the, for the law courts. The original lane was narrow at 20 feet wide and was widened to 30 feet with 10 foot wide paths, including a handsome, with handsome posts along the dividing line. Mr Gillies was soon to turn was soon to turn the upgraded lane into a, an arcade to give it a colonial romance. Mr Gillies also changed the name of the hotel in Gillies Arcade from the Queen's Head to the Grey's Inn in honour of Governor Grey. The new Queen's Theatre, you can see the new Queen's. <laughs> that's right. You can see the new Queen's Theatre on the uh, left hand side of the old theatre. There's that little tiny building there. So that's the access for the upper class people and then on the other side was where the pit people used to come in. With an agreement in place, Mr Solomon, with Mr Solomon, George Coppin arrived in Adelaide with his wife Marie on the 10th of September 1846 to oversee the construction of the new theatre. The theatre was built on the billiard room attached to the western side of the Temple Tavern. The theatre was built to accommodate 200 patrons the dress boxes would accommodate 500 patrons. Oh, and 500 patrons in the pit, sorry. The opening night on Monday, the 2nd of November, 1846, proved to be a great success, other than some early concerns at the night when someone yelled out, fire. <laughs> yeah, no, good thing to do, isn't it? But it was quickly, quickly realised that this was a joke and it was referred to Marie Coppin's accident in a recent rehearsal when her dress caught on fire. The guy should be a comedian, I think. 
Sadly, Marie Coppin died of consumption in August 1848 and is buried in the West Terrace Cemetery. Mr Coppin managed the theatre until Mr Laser returned from Sydney in February 1848 and Mr Laser managed it successfully until the Royal Victoria Theatre was opened in December 1850. Encouraged by Mr Laser's success with the new Queen's Theatre, Mr Solomon decided to renovate the old Queen's Theatre after the courts vacated the premise in July 1850. Mr Sullivan, Solomon spent 15 to £16,000 on the renovations and then leased the theatre, hotel and refreshments rooms to Measures Coppin and Laser for three years at £500 per annum. A portion of the former Osmond Street that Mr Solomon purchased in 1843 was used to allow the construction of the new facade that you see today, that little extra bit he's put there. The grand opening of the new theatre was, took place on the evening of the 23rd of December 1850. By October 1851, Solomon decided to close the theatre after losing £70 a week. The theatre still remained open due to the efforts of Mr Coppin and Mr Laser and under other individual managers. In 1855, Mr Solomon contracted Mr Atwood to remove the theatre's old wooden shingle roof and replace it with a galvanised iron with the galvanised iron sheeting. Mr. Atwood eventually took Mr. Solomon to court over the costs. I thought it was just something to throw in there <laughs> about the building. In September 1859, the theatre was had extensive refit uh, with luxury seating installed in the boxes, with room for an extra 80 patrons. In 1868, Mr. Johannes Shermer took the lease on the theatre and renamed it the Prado. The Prado was now the venue of masquerade balls, amateur nights and burlesque shows. Mr Shermer was prosecuted for allowing prostitutes to enter the venue and soon become insolvent. After the Prado, the building was used as a Mechanics Institute in 1871, tobacco manufacturer in 1872, the City Mission shifted in there in 1872 and a horse bazaar after 1877. So. That's basically the history of it. Um, you want to just, I've got some pictures now. That is an amazing picture. That was found in the Ark, uh, Lot State Library. And for 1850, that's an amazing picture. And on the right hand side, it's been, that's Mr. Laser, Mr. Coppin. And the third one from the other side, we assume, is Mr. Opie, which is an amazing picture. These are two sketches done by John. Uh, yeah, these are two sketches done by John Skipper uh, during her performances when she was in Adelaide. Just a picture of the theatre. I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the old theatre. You can see the extension to the front of it, where they did 1850. And that's, that's the row of houses that uh, Mr um, Solomon built. And I think he sold them in 1852 to a Mr Raphael. So that's... Main complex. You see, the the, the hotel, the theatre is still in its basically original um, format, other than the extension on the front. Just a picture of George Coppin in 1855. Mr. William Easter, he he died in Adelaide, so he was one of the very few that ever stayed here, other than Marie Coppin, who's in the in the in West Terrace. That's Mr. Emmanuel Solomon. That's the, th uh, the building in, in uh, 1919. That's the book. Okay. I'll just tell you what's in the book, just for interest's sake. The book contains 198 pages of concentrated detail with 105 pages dedica dedicated to the Queen's Theatre plus the other two uh, theatres. There's an, included in the index, there's a separate index that uh, details a 73 individual incidents related to the theatre, like um, robberies, fights, accidents, comical incidents and notable acts that happened in and around the theatre, but they're actually separately indexed. Oh, and of course the elephant. The elephant was there at one stage. There's separate information on various hotels, including the Adelaide Tavern, the Billy Barlow Hotel, Shakespeare Hotel, Adelaide Shades, Queen's Head and the Southern Cross Tavern. There's appendices which includes maps, the story of Billy Barlow, the Billy Barlow song, the story of the ship, the Ville de Bordeaux, 
Mr. Solomon's Assets on Sale at 1852, and Mr. Laser's Comical Menu of the uh, Blenheim Palace, uh, Bellum Hotel when he owned it. He sort of turned the, the menu into like a, an act, a series of acts. It's a bit weird. And there's five interesting stories at the back on Robert Radford, Mr. Clay, Isaac Nomis, Thomas the Elephant, and a special overland story about the overland route in 1853 to the Victorian goldfields. That's it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. If that was your maiden voyage, well done. Thank you. It actually, it actually took me longer to write that than the book. <laughs> One of the things that makes going to the theatre today pretty interesting is the stage lighting and the effects that were, cre you know, were created. What happened? Back well, in the good old days. Well, I, I don't know, but I guess there are oil lights. Uh, oil, whale oil, I would assume. Uh, I recall reading that the Queen's Theatre and later the, the New Queen's was used uh, for uh, ceremonies for the Jewish community uh, after hours. Um, very high component of Jewish um, actors, basically. Yeah. Um, Solomons and John the Lazer. Was, was His wife was a Solomon as well. So, yeah. Yeah. What, what just just a comment. Just oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, we'll see. They were they were not only Jewish, but they were also very heavily involved in the Masonic lodges and the, the, all the other lodges. So that also was another story too. They used to hold a lot of lodge meetings there, and like you said, the Jewish families and that used to come there. No, I'm not sure when that one was built in Craven Street. I'm not sure when that came up. That was the first synagogue, I think, wasn't it? I'm not sure. Ian, thanks for that. That's a very interesting, yeah, very, very interesting uh, side or different side to what we appreciate as the pioneers. Yeah. Um, but can you tell me about the elephant, and um, can, do you know which act he appeared in, and was it in Queen's Theatre? Yeah. Um, what the story was that uh, Mr. Bentley, Thomas Bentley, opened up the Cremorne Hotel and Gardens on Unley, Unley Road. I think it was a 1851 or 1853, I'll have to look at my book, 1855, I don't know. But he was the publican of the Whitehorse cellar at this time and he bought the elephant off a sea captain. And it was quite young, I think it was about five years old. And he, he was building at the Cremorne uh, Gardens and Hotel on Unley Road at the time. And then he would get a handler to take it into the theatre and just sort of parade it around. It didn't do any acts, so much like circus acts or anything, it was just... He bought it in. I think they probably just did some tricks or something. I'm not really sure. But he did go into the uh, Queen's Theatre a few times. There's a story in the book about the handler, uh, an Indian guy taking Mr Bentley to court for funds because he wasn't paying his um, salary and things like that. That gives you a lot of details in there. Did you want to know any more about the, the theatre? The... Oh, OK. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And some familiar names there, but... Uh... Uh, my, the, the lot in the pits could have made life quite uncomfortable for mm. some of the other people attending. Um, I certainly, uh, in Mary Thomas's book, she talks about um, uh, going to the theatre uh, and I think with her daughters and if you had John Skipper painting something. Yeah. Um, just a couple of other comments. Um, yes, the Jewish community and um, John Lazar, uh, was actually a mayor of Adelaide. Yes. yes. And uh, there is, I think, uh, in the Adelaide City Archives, um, uh, quite a good photograph of, of him. Um, and the other comment I was going to make about uh, George Coppin, and I'm, I meant to try and bring yes. a little booklet with me, but um, he must have at some stage uh, done quite well or made some money because um, I believe that he was sort of a benefactor later for um, aged um, actors and whatever and established, I think, the old colonists' home, which is still run 
yeah. in is it Fitzroy on, in Melbourne? Yeah, I'm not sure. I know it's in Melbourne. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it, it's close in, in, in Melbourne there. Um, we had a, a cousin who, yep. who lived there and he had this booklet um, and it's certainly um, down to George Coppin. So um, he obviously transferred to Melbourne, I guess. Yeah. But um, he, you know, must have been a very interesting character. I've never heard about Billy Barlow, but that would have been interesting to know. <laughs> yeah, but you've got to realise that Mr uh, Coppin was very famous for getting funding. You know, I don't know if he ever had much money himself, but he used everybody else's money. And I know I heard the story that when he went to Sorrento in Victoria, he built the internet, Intercontinental Hotel there or something, and he got the builder that he'd um, shafted in Adelaide that built the... Um, the White Horse Cellar and took him over there to build that and all stories like that. But, yeah, I've seen the picture of uh, a couple of his pictures on the internet about the old colonist thingy. I think there's pictures up there on the internet. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, just curious, um, what physical remains are there of those theatres? I'm familiar with the Queen's Theatre and I think the White Horse Inn is at Port Adelaide, but at the others, are there many physical remnants at all or are they long gone? Absolutely nothing. Um, the the uh, the Adelaide Tavern in about 1860 was knocked down by Mr Solomon and and rebuilt as uh, like private houses. The others just disappeared. It was like the the bush, uh, the one that was in uh, Franklin Street that was just in a hotel. So they're all very minor things. It was only the Queen's Seat. It was a substantial building. Just as an aside, yeah. Um, with all of these live theatres. Where did they get the actors from? Where did they get the performers from? Were they basically locals and people who'd settled here? Were they colonists and all that? Or did they import the actors from overseas? Where did the actual performers come from, do we know? Well, most of the actors I've come across are from overseas. Uh, even like uh, Mr Bonner, the uh, the guy that started the, uh, the first one, he was a compositor and he'd come out from Scotland. So... Um, there might have been a few local guys, but majority of them were actors that were touring around Australia. They'd go bankrupt over in that, and say in Hobart, and then they'd disappear over to here. So they're always mobile all the time. But majority of them would have been from England originally. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>